What are we talking about today, Emily? We're discussing mortgages, business loans, and co-signing loans, domestic partnerships, and freezing your credit. Welcome to the Science of Wealth, where we discuss the science behind financial planning and the art of learning and applying it. Well, welcome to the science of wealth. So I guess if we're talking about mortgages and business loans and co-signing loans and all sorts of stuff, uh, there's a lot to cover here. So Emily, why don't you tell me a little bit about kind of why you want to talk about this? Well, all of my questions are stemming from a meeting we had this past week with somebody. She had come in and was very much so wanting to help someone close to her in her life, but wasn't really sure the best way to do it without putting herself in a pretty risky position. And it was kind of wanting to know the long-term effects of the different things she was hoping to do for them. So I have several questions because we had several different angles that we kind of thought about going in regards to helping that person she was close to. Ah, okay. So as far as kind of the dynamics there and for anybody can kind of, uh, I think, wondering kind of what the context would be for some of this, the, the really big issue that's coming up in this particular case is this is somebody who was thinking about uh, helping a, a friend or a family member purchase a home or start a business or possibly both. And we had a pretty long conversation about the pros and cons, the different ways they'd want to approach that. So uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and tee you up here, Emily. What do you want to know from that? Or what, what should we cover first? My first big question is the liabilities attached to co-signing and someone else's mortgage. There's some obvious ones financially, and then there's some other more hidden ones that I know we've kind of touched on when you and I have been talking, but I don't know the specifics of exactly what you're taking on when you co-sign someone else's mortgage. Sure. So when you co-sign a loan, the easiest thing to think about there is you are telling this bank or this financial institution or whoever you're borrowing from that you and this other party, right, we are borrowing this money. So that means you are liable for it. That does not necessarily mean that you are then going to be a beneficiary of what that co-signed loan purchases or pay for pays for. So for example, lots of parents will co-sign loans for their kid's college through PLUS loans or or will co-sign their kid's first lease when they kind of go out into the world and want to have their first apartment, but their kid doesn't have an earnings history. So the landlord says, mm, I, you know, I want you to have somebody co-sign this for you. That's a pretty common thing. And in a lot of cases, it's just a, a regular practice and it's relatively harmless. But as financial planners, we always want to think about things in the most negative potential terms, right? What is the risk adjusted decision we could make? And really the risk when you co-sign for a loan of any type is that the person you're co-signing for just doesn't pay it does, and they, they default on it because then you're faced with a decision. Either the money that's being borrowed here is going to have to be repaid by you because you've made a personal guarantee or it's not going to get repaid and your credit is going to take a really serious hit because now you have this delinquent loan. And that can be something where depending on the nature of the loan, it might be secured by what it paid for, or you may have made even personal guarantees where you can actually be gone after personally and your assets be gone after personally because you have not fulfilled the obligation you made when you co-signed the loan. How long does something like that affect your credit? I mean, functionally, as long as the liability is unpaid and is continuously unpaid in perpetuity, or at the very least, kind of at the point where it goes away, right, the, the matter is closed, it's settled, whatever the case is, that can still follow you around for about seven years, close to a decade. And so that's pretty damaging. That, that's something where not only can the initial missed payment hurt your credit, but then every subsequent missed payment can hurt your credit. And then it might compound and really trash your credit and leave you effectively unable to borrow money or utilize or leverage credit for close to 10 years. And isn't there something to consider if it's, say you don't already own a home, so this is your first mortgage and you co-sign for someone else, does that count towards then if you try to buy a house for what you have to use as a down payment and everything? Yeah, so that's one of the biggest issues here. You know, a lot of people will, in a good hearted way, co sign stuff for their family members or really close friends. But when you are not 
already passed that hurdle, for example, helping somebody buy a home and you don't own a home for yourself, you've created a problem because when you co-sign on that, you're usually helping them co-sign for a personal residence loan. And that means that you then on your credit and in your borrowing history also have a personal residence loan on your history. So then when you later go to buy your own home, that can really cause you some pretty severe issues where you are not able to qualify to purchase your own home or you're going to have to pay higher interest rates on your own residence because they're not clear from an underwriting standpoint whether you are or are not going to be a resident of the home you're trying to purchase. Would that mean you also wouldn't qualify for things like a first-time home buyer program? Uh, maybe. I think that would really depend on the terms of the program. But I think the bigger issue that's going to arise here is uh, your debt to income ratio, right? Fundamentally, when you go to apply for your mortgage, you're going to have to tell them, hey, here's everything I make. Here's all the money I owe in terms of my student loans, auto loans, and the other liabilities. But you're going to have to list that co-signed loan because technically you potentially might have to pay for that loan. And so your debt to income ratio might look terrible when we account for the fact that you already have a mortgage that is theoretically on your financial history. Hmm. Well, okay. So that sounds like a risky thing to do. And for this person that we were talking to, they're all thinking about helping them with a business loan and starting something up. Is that a less risky thing to do? I think that's probably even riskier particularly for like starting up a business, just because usually when you take out any sort of loan to start a business, for, and first and foremost, there's not just like a bank for good ideas. They are going to lend you money that needs to be collateralized by something, whether it's an existing business that has a strong earnings history and a brand and equipment and you know software or products or whatever it is, right? You're, you're purchasing an asset via that loan. And even if you can qualify for a small business loan, to help start up a business, that loan is largely going to be pushed towards only being used for collateralized things. So again, uh, like you could get furniture, you could get signage, you could get uh, like a big printing press or something that's going to be used in the operations of the business. But most banks are going to be highly, highly resistant, if not downright, just going to turn you down uh, to giving you working capital. So borrowing money to pay for the initial payroll, for example, because there's no collateral for that. That's essentially uh, them just giving you money in the hopes that you're going to turn it around and make something out of it. Whereas if you default on your business loan, they could at least sell that printing press or the furniture or the desks or whatever to try to recoup some of their loss. Hmm. So that's also incredibly risky. <laughs> what if you still really want to help that person and you buy a house, but you rent it to them, then you, you at least own the house and you have the asset. That would be safer for you, but I, I think that actually brings up an issue with co-signing in the first place, which is just because you co-signed on the loan doesn't mean you own the property, right? So you know, just because you co-sign on a mortgage doesn't make you an owner of the property. That property still might be entitled for that third party and not for you. So then you've added your name to a liability with absolutely no return on the risk that you're taking from a financial standpoint. But if you go the route of, let's say, purchasing a rental property and then letting your family member rent it, maybe you're doing like a rent to own sort of program, that's actually all potentially doable. And it's a little bit lower risk to you from the standpoint that you now at least have ownership of the asset. The biggest risk that arises here is uh, just the fact that they are a tenant. And so they, like any other tenant, whether they're family or friends or not, could damage damage the property, not keep it up well, uh, do things that you don't approve of or want them to do in it, like smoke or have pets or you know, try to do a, a renovation or decoration. Uh, and in this regard, I think contracts make for really good partnerships. So, you know, just because they're family doesn't mean you just say, hey, you know, send me $1,500 a month via Venmo and we're good, right? You, you really do still want to have a lease and an agreement and all of that. And then in terms of buying it for them with the intent that they're going to become an owner at some point, Depending on how you've structured that deal, the fact that you're making them an owner of the property, kind of in a rent to own program, even though it might be at a very reasonable rate as far as the rent goes, if it's not at market rates, then technically you're giving them a gift. And if the gift is small enough, that's not really an issue. But if the value of the gift is substantial, where it exceeds gift tax uh, exemption limits on an annualized basis, then you could end up needing to file gift tax returns or paying gift taxes, depending on your financial situation, to, uh, just to cover the fact that you're essentially giving money away or giving value away to this friend or family member. Hmm. So there really isn't a great way to help someone without taking on a lot of liability. 
That is not true at all. The The bigger element here is that I think anybody who's thinking about helping their family member, whether it's buy a home or, you know, getting a car or starting a business, whatever the idea here is that you want to help with, I think it's much more important to get real clarity on what level of financial commitment you're willing to make to them, i.e. saying, hey, I'll help you with a down payment or I'll even, you know, buy you a cheap car or I will, you know, invest in your business uh, as a startup and, and that sort of thing or I'll just give you money. I think lending Sending money to family is really problematic. It, it can put a lot of stress on relationships and the same thing with friendships, of course. But I think when it comes to something as huge as, hey, I want to buy a house, will, will you co-sign with me? I think a much better route is saying, hey, I'll help you with a down payment or I'll help you with qualification. Or if I own a business, you know, I'll hire you and you can earn more money to help improve your debt to income ratio, uh, you know, all sorts of things like that. But I think co-signing your name to something, particularly something you do not have a financial interest in and that you may have substantial personal liability because we haven't even talked about, hey, what if somebody slips, trips and falls uh, at that house and then they sue the owner and that encumbers the property and all of that. So in those circumstances, I think it's much better to say, here's the level of support I'm willing to give you. It's a number or it's an amount of time or energy, but you've got to think really, really seriously about the risks you take when you co-sign for family members or friends. I think it's a slightly different dynamic when you're a parent helping their child get out into the world, but when it's just your sibling, your cousin, your buddy from college, whatever it is, I really advise caution here because everybody comes in with good intentions, but you can find that people's position on things changes pretty dramatically from the time before you agree to co-sign on something and after you co-sign on something and the effects once you've signed on something, you can't undo it if you don't like how it's going. Hmm. I guess it does make a lot of sense, but that leads to another question that I have. <laughs> thinking of relationships with people. I was talking to someone else in my life and they had said that they'd registered for a domestic partnership so that he could be on her health insurance. But I remember talking to you about domestic partnerships months ago and you said there wasn't a lot behind them, like in a legal sense, like as far as being a beneficiary or something. How much power and kind of what are the parameters, what goes along with a domestic partnership? So this is really going to depend state by state by state. Every state treats domestic partnerships differently. So when you get into domestic partnerships, you have to recognize that they essentially were invented as a proxy for marriage, but with none of the clear cut advantages. So the law for marriage also varies state by state, right? Some states are community property states, some are not. Uh, but in those context in the way that that works. Uh, effectively, domestic partnerships were designed to provide a bridge for unmarried couples. Uh, and the obvious sort of audience for this were going to be LGBTQAIP plus folks uh, who are in not in heterosexual marriages or relationships. And they were designed to do some basic things like extend the benefits of health care or give rights for hospital visitation. The problem here is not only are they different state by state, but also you run into some pretty substantial Substantial disadvantages with them. Uh, marriage conveys a number of really powerful special rights and privileges. Uh, so for example, in Colorado, you cannot disinherit your spouse, whereas if you're in a domestic partnership, the, your partner is not legally entitled to just to receive the benefits of your estate uh, by default. You can absolutely uh, disinherit them or, or exclude them from your relationship. Uh, mar you know, spouses have an unlimited marital exemption for inherited property. So uh, you know, if Jeff Bezos passes away and has a hundred billion dollars, his spouse, uh, I don't think he's remarried, or if he has, uh, you know, whoever his spouse may, may or may not be one day, uh, could inherit, you know, all hundred billion dollars plus of his wealth and not have to pay any taxes on it. But if he was just in a domestic partnership, that would not be the same case. Uh, and then there's just a certain level of discrimination and exemption where people in domestic partnerships are not always respected or given rights on a practical level, even if they have state law behind them saying a person in a domestic partnership has a right to make medical decisions or has the right to visit people in a hospital, but you will find a not insignificant amount of discrimination in the real world where certain institutions will essentially say, hey, are you this person's husband? Are you this person's wife? No, then we don't recognize your relationship and we're not going to treat you as this person's partner. Oh, so there's actually, I mean, there's some benefits to it, but not not very many, as long as we're comparing it to like a legal marriage. 
And I think that's probably the, the best framework there. You know, being in a domestic partnership as far as rights and conveyances and privileges is better than not being in a domestic partnership insofar as a partnership and financial considerations goes. But a domestic partnership does not hold a candle to being legally married. Uh, there's just a substantial difference in rights and privileges. And it's why, in part, at least for the LGBTQ AIP plus community, there was such a huge push on gay marriage and such a push back against being told that marriage was not special or was not any better because in a real economic sense, there was a huge disparity between the rights and privileges of married couples both during their lives and then also after their deaths and couples who had to live under a domestic partnership. Mm. If you're trying to undo a domestic partnership, is it easier than like going through a divorce legally or it's much easier to dissolve? Once again, this is going to be a state by state issue. I would say it is easier to dissolve than a divorce because there are less protections, but there's still an element of paperwork cost and administration that goes to it. Um, you know, it, It's not like a common law marriage where you can just sort of hold out as married and then you just sort of are married under law at a certain point, depending on how states treat that. Domestic partnerships, you, know, you do have to file some paperwork affirmatively to declare it, and you do have to file some paperwork to undo it. So unlike common law marriage where you can just sort of start saying, hey, we're married and that will eventually apply, uh, you will have to kind of jump through hoops to get into it and jump into hoops or jump through hoops to get out of it. Hmm. Okay, I guess it answers all my questions on that topic. <laughs> <laughs> I have one final question for today, though. I was talking to yet another person last week about uh, credit scores, and they had mentioned that their credit was frozen. And they didn't really have a good understanding of what that meant, how to undo it, and what happened to their credit score while it was frozen. So I have a whole list of things there. But do you have any advice on someone whose credit score is frozen? So I think the better way of thinking of this is that it's not that their credit score is frozen. It's that they've frozen their credit. And there's a really key distinction there. Uh, saying somebody's frozen their credit score creates the impression that their credit score is now just like locked. So in a perfect world, I get my credit score to 850, right? I have a literally perfect credit score. And then I'm going to freeze my credit and my credit score is forever going to be 850. That is not how it works. Freezing your credit means that you are telling the credit bureaus not to provide information regarding your credit score to borrowers and lending organizations. And what that means in practice and, and the, the value of that is that then nobody's going to lend you money, right? So a bank isn't going to lend you money. Nobody's going to let you open a credit card, et cetera, without doing a credit check on you. And so when your credit is frozen, the credit bureaus will essentially say, sorry, this person's credit's frozen. We're not telling you anything. And in turn, that means they won't lend you money. However, that does not mean that your credit score is now locked in and frozen and that nothing bad can happen to it. So if you miss payments, if you do bad things with your credit, if you have negative remarks, whatever the case is, that can still cause your credit score to go up or down, depending on whether you are still exhibiting the practices of good credit and good behavior or not. Oh, I see. Is it difficult to get it unfrozen once it has been? I would say it's easier to freeze than unfreeze, but it's not substantially more burdensome. When you freeze your credit, that's a protective measure. So the credit bureaus just sort of say, sure, we'll go ahead and freeze that for you. When you want to unfreeze it, there's always going to be a little bit more caution around doing that because the whole purpose of freezing your credit really is about protecting you from identity theft or you know, irresponsible credit behaviors. Uh, so you know, most people will go through the process of freezing their credit to keep themselves from having you know like a credit card open under their name or borrowing money under their name via identity theft. But some people also engage in it just as a sort of prophylactic measure. They just want to say, hey, I'm not planning on borrowing money anytime soon, so let's just go ahead and lock this down. And in some other cases, particularly in households where things like gambling has been a problem or bad borrowing behaviors have been a problem, sometimes somebody will freeze their credit to kind of protect themselves from themselves or spouses might freeze their other spouse's credit to go ahead and kind of protect them from their spouse irresponsibly borrowing borrowing or taking money out without their know-how. So that way there's a little bit more of a formalized process around getting their credit unfrozen so they can then have a more formalized process around borrowing more money in the future. Oh, I see. Is there certain time requirements for it? Like, can I freeze my credit today and unfreeze it tomorrow? 
not so much a time requirement so much as just like the paperwork. So in the same way that you could say you wanted to like change your 401k withholding day to day, you can always submit the request to freeze it and then submit the request to unfreeze it. Uh, however, processing time may vary. And if you're trying to like switch it on and off over and over again, that's probably going to flag the interest of the credit bureau and they may slow you down and ask you to explain like, what, what are you doing? Why do you keep doing it back and forth for whatever reason? Hmm. Okay. So if I lose my credit cards, that's not my first move is to freeze my credit. Your first move is to call your credit company and tell them your card has been stolen or lost so they can close the card and cancel it. Because that's the thing, like having your debit card stolen or your credit card stolen or having the card skimmed, you know, if you use a, uh, a device that's being used to capture your credit card information, the easiest thing they're going to do there, they're not even going to steal your credit. They can't open a line of credit under your name with just your credit card number or having stolen your physical card. They can just spend your money. So the fastest thing to do there is just to go ahead and shut that line of access down and get your card reissued so that nobody can steal it from you. And in that regard, I think it's not a question of you know if your credit will ever be stolen or your credit card will be stolen or your information will be stolen. It's a question of when. So in terms of you know, freezing your credit, I think that's a good move to do whenever you have no anticipation of borrowing money at any time in the immediate future, i.e. the next one, two, three, four years. Or otherwise, when you are perfectly satisfied with your credit position and have no desire to borrow for the foreseeable future. But I wouldn't go around just freezing your credit and then like unfreezing it real quick to get out a new credit card and then refreezing it. I think that's a little bit overkill in that regard because there are a good number of consumer protections around your money being stolen. Uh, Credit freezing is much more about protecting you from identity theft than it is from just having people not be able to steal your money out of your credit card or out of your bank account. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Once again, very thorough. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> I think one thing you did not bring up here, but it's in a, a tangential area to this subject is uh, getting a pin for your tax returns. Uh, I think that's something that is becoming more and more common is that part of identity theft is not just stealing your name and your social security number and whatnot and trying to open credit cards and that sort of thing, but people filing false tax returns under your information to try to sort of redirect your uh, tax refund or create a tax refund that is fraudulent. That is a lot more damaging because the government is not efficient at fixing that whatsoever. And so if they receive a tax return in your name with your information on it, they will assume that it is yours and they will send any refund fund that is due out. If you then discover that after the fact, because you try to submit a return and it gets rejected because they say, sorry, you've already submitted a return, uh, then it's going to take a lot more work to essentially get the original return amended to the correct re return. In the meantime, you know, their ability to investigate and enforce the identity theft element of that and holding you accountable for repaying a false refund is going to be a situation where you probably end up being told you have to repay it before they ever recognize that it was actually stolen and that you were a victim of theft. So that's another area that's not per se freezing your credit, but an area to really go ahead and pr kind of proactively protect yourself to make sure that somebody can't file returns uh, illegally or without your authorization uh, or just by stealing your identity. And that's becoming more common or it always has been kind of a big problem? It's definitely getting more and more and more common over time. Uh, you know, tax returns have gotten more complicated and particularly in the last couple of years through things like the Paycheck uh, Protection Act and employee retention credits and whatnot, particularly for business owners, that identity theft exposure and risk has gotten substantially larger over time. And so they become bigger and bigger targets as the government has gotten more willing to pay back credits or pay out refunds to individuals and business owners through their tax return. Oh. Good. One more thing to look out for. Yeah, you know, always, always stay, uh, stay cautious and make sure you're protecting yourself. Uh, you know, you have a lot of protections through credit card companies. You have less protections through your bank account and the government will protect you in the end, most likely, but the government does not hold itself accountable the same way that it holds private entities uh, with significant power like credit bureaus accountable. And it'll take longer the government way. Uh, the government is known for many things, but efficiency is not one of them. <laughs> that sounds about right. Okay. So you have wrapped up your Series 7 study, uh, I think as of this morning, technically you've gotten all the way through it. So same question as last week, uh, though we didn't really talk about anything that was covered by your 7 today. Whether it's from your 7 or something else, what is the most interesting or useful thing you've learned in your studies over the past week? I've actually some enjoyed the annuity section one, because it wasn't as hard as the others for me, because we talk about them at work all the time. But also, there's just such a variety of them. And 
you know, reading about them and learning about them on the front end, they sound like a good idea and they can be, but I'm also very pressed isn't the word, but I guess surprised how often they can be misused and then they end up being a terrible thing to have, a terrible investment. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, annuities are very much like any other set of tools or medications or, you know, pick your metaphor here. But, you know, if you use the right tool for the right job, they're great. If you use the wrong tool for the wrong job, then it's terrible. Uh, and in that regard, you know, annuities are a very powerful and useful tool when used appropriately and are a really terrible tool for everything else. Mm. Yeah, I like the idea of them, but I would still be very cautious to get one at any point in my life just until I'd really researched it. I think the the good prophylactics there are, number one, don't buy an annuity before you need one. Or if you're buying one kind of preemptively, really do your homework on when you're going to actually make use of it and how the particular product you're looking at is going to be used. So like there's very little reason for a 25-year-old to ever pick up an annuity uh, unless they are crazy, crazy high income and they're looking for any possible tax shelters. There's reasons to use annuities for that purpose, but it's very far down the list of, of preferred choices. And then otherwise, kind of going into retirement, I think it's just very, as a point of caution, probably just don't sink all of your money into an annuity, maybe a portion, 25%, 20%, 50% if you really want to lock some things down. Uh, but I think the biggest place people get into trouble is they meet a slick salesman who convinces them that the annuity will solve all of their retirement income problems, and they suck all of their life savings into it and cash their commission check and run off into the sunset. And now you're stuck with a very, very expensive and complex insurance product that you may not fully have understood and now are going to have to pay a lot of money to get out of. Well, how would you avoid that? They're very complicated. If you were trying to do it on your own, how do you avoid ending up with a salesman like that? I think first and foremost, you should do as much homework as you can on kind of just researching it. So both researching annuities in general before you buy one, and then when one is being presented to you, just grilling the heck out of the person selling it to you. And then frankly, even if it's just a you know, an hourly financial planner as a second opinion or something, I don't think you need to go hire like us as a fully comprehensive financial planning firm uh, to go and, and just answer the annuity question here. But just get a second opinion. Get somebody who has no financial interest in whether you buy the annuity or not to review it and say, hey, this does or does not make sense for you. So that way you at least have some confidence that somebody who's not getting paid to sell it to you is to Telling you that it's good for you in that case, or is helping you avoid the mistake of buying it if it turns out it wasn't a good choice for you. Hmm. Always get a second opinion. Always good advice. Never hurts. The Science of Wealth is produced by My Wealth Planners, a registered investment advisor in Colorado. The theme song is This Is Your Time by Dan Phillips. The podcast is intended for educational purposes only and is not investment advice or any other form of advice. Not all material discussed on the podcast is appropriate for every individual in every circumstance, so you should consult with a certified financial planner, tax professional, or legal professional as appropriate before attempting to apply any of the subjects, strategies, or tactics discussed on the podcast. 